Yeah. Uh, and you say something to the client, hey, look, this is 10 grand is great, but um, it's, it's really time to get something positive into your property uh, portfolio. But mm. people are busy. Yeah, I'll get around to that. Um, it, it, human nature is often, until we feel the pain, we won't change. <laughs> Welcome, Gareth. Thanks for um, dialing in today. We've got Gareth Collard from Epsom Tax. He's a principal uh, of Epsom Tax. Uh, Gareth deals with accounting for um, properties, deals with a lot of property developers specifically, and, uh, and uh, great to have you here. Thanks, Gareth. Nice to be uh on Zoom with you today. <laughs> yes, the last couple of days of lockdown in Auckland, so we're, uh, we're, we're getting there, yeah. Hey, uh, so tell us a little bit about um, maybe just some changes that, uh, that have occurred in the accounting world or just sort of give us an update of what's happening in relation to property in the, in the accounting world. Yeah, I think some of the things that uh, property investors need to be aware of is you know, you're now one feeling the impact of the renting in your residential um, losses because that's affecting the, the FY20, so the uh, 1928 tax returns, which would now be being processed by the, by the accountant. Uh, second impact is that the asset threshold was looking from $500 to $5,000. So for anyone who's fortunate enough to buy something after the 17th of March this year, you might have just got into the last part of last financial year. Uh, but otherwise, you've got you know, a year to spend lots of $5,000 on your rental and claim that whole expense instead of having to write that off over several years or depreciate it. And then the third thing would be these uh, Residential Tenancies Act amendments, which have just passed. And not all of them start straight away, but over the, the next six months are going to be phased in. So those are kind of three big impacts. Uh, and maybe just a fourth I'll chip in is that some landlords have been able to receive the COVID-19 subsidy uh, because it was being paid to them, and now that uh, that income is gone. But there's had to be a little bit of back and forth with notice between MSD and Wynn saying uh, one thing, and then the person having to come back, usually consult with, uh, with, with us, and then go back to MSD. So uh, just something to keep in mind for a few, there may still be the opportunity to claim a subsidy for a couple of weeks if they went to be adversely affected, and they meet the... Uh, the the forty percent drop off on the forty percent drop yeah that's right yeah well that's fascinating so I'll, we'll start with the um, the ring fence losses because that came through I mean a couple of years ago right and and I mean twenty twenty is moving slow but accounting world moves very slowly because things happen a year after the financial year and and so it, uh, this as you say this will only just be affecting clients now and they they will have been maybe expecting a um, their usual tax back that they got and and uh, and maybe aren't doing it. Are you seeing a lot of people adjust how they uh, structure their accounting? Are you seeing people move away from, God, I still want to call them LAQCs, but L LTCs, uh, are you seeing people move away or are they still in there and just kind of accepting those those losses staying there? Uh, the, the answer is uh, yes to all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> so a variety of responses. So we've seen some decide to um, cash up and sell out. That's not usually people with multiple rentals. It might be they've had one. It's quite heavily cash flow negative, i.e. making a loss, and they're probably not in the mindset or in a position to get something else to offset that loss. So they've just uh, sold up and, and cashed up their uh, capital gains, hopefully. Um, others... I mean, we've been talking to our clients for several years about you know what's going to happen, and some have actually listened to us. So <laughs> that means some wow, are at the, yeah, <laughs> wow, amazing. Um, so that means some are in a position where they're actually going to have uh, it's either on paper they're making a loss, but the reality is not costing them anything. So that loss might only be say depreciation and a, a sort of a little bit of home office or something like that. Um, so it, it's not a real loss, as it were. It's not coming out of their pocket. So that's sort of an acceptable situation. Um, and, and others have been looking to get a cheaper cash flow positive rental to bring into their portfolio so they've got some cash coming in. 
so that maybe the whole thing is still slightly negative, but not as negative. And their weekly contribution might have dropped from, say, 150 weeks to $50 a week, which is a little more bearable, um, especially seeing as you're putting $50 a week in the bank, they're going to give you pretty much nothing at the moment. <laughs> yeah. You know, okay. uh, so if you're putting $50 into your rental, uh, well, maybe that's a kind of uh, saving which is going to get you a better result over the long term. Um, and, and I guess we've also seen them do things like um, look at break fees, renegotiate mortgages, et cetera, engaging with the mortgage advisor, that's been a key thing. Uh, a lot have done that to try and get that. Probably the easy first step, go and talk to your mortgage advisor. Oh, thank you for the plug. Yes, that's it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so, uh, and, and I was going to say that was that there'd probably be a lot of people who were negatively geared at 4.5%, right, a couple of years ago. And sort of I interviewed a, a group of investment uh, property finders the other day, and they said you can even find positive cash flow properties in Auckland, which was it's been a couple of decades since that happened, right? <laughs> so low interest rates. So that, that's quite good. But I think in a, if, if humans acted rationally, then we would have seen a whole lot of people ditch these negatively geared investment properties and find the positive it's, it's hard to argue for a negatively geared um portfolio po you know totally negatively geared but i think what everyone's done is either you know broken those rates or uh yeah as you say gone to grab a um, positively geared property or are you finding that your clients are generally enthusiastic about this uh, the property market at the moment um I haven't had sort of a whole lot of negativity about it. There's, you know, there's always, it's like the bell curve. You know, you have those who are really positive, those who are really depressed, and then sort of everybody else who um, doesn't think about it just too much. Apathetic like, about it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was just thinking, actually, getting back to your question earlier, you, you mentioned about LTCs, and I didn't actually address that. Uh, but, at times, we are seeing the use of look-through companies, but they're in more specialised situations. So they're the situations whereby perhaps someone has all of their property in investments. Now they want to buy a family home, and so they will sell one of those properties or all of them perhaps to a look-through company. And so they end up then with sort of little or no debt on the new family home and all the debt on the rental in one of those at least being in a look-through company. Uh, so that's or they've moved out of their old family home into a new one, and now you know their new one's loaded with debt, but the old one, which is now a rental, has got um, hardly any debt on it. So we've seen look-through companies used for that. Uh, so they are there, um, but it's it's a it's a much more sort of specific situation where we're saying use a look-through company. Quite often we're suggesting you can achieve the same thing with a partnership. Uh, you know, use a partnership agreement, etc. There's probably even a little bit more flexibility rather than going down the look through company route. And I think the main thing that's changed that is the ring fencing of residential property losses. You need a bit more flexibility these days, which LPCs it's it's they're not as flexible as say a partnership or if it's distribution of income, that a trust is sort of king of flexibility in terms of distribution of income. Yeah, yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of people who maybe bought a couple of houses five years ago that set up a structure that was right for the time that probably need to review that, right? And just, just look at how they're holding their, their assets and is it still correct in today's world? Would, that, would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and sometimes um, it's, it's not so much the structure that's wrong. We have had some clients come back to us and say, well, what's the point of this look-through company now? Is this even benefiting me? And the answer is, well, it was a good structure back then. Uh, your laws have changed, but it, the problem here is not the structure, actually. It's, it's inevitably is the balance of a negative, you know, something which is maybe too negative, which they were happy to get a tax refund and support before, but now that's gone. The, in effect, the, it's become very unbalanced, you know. So, um, and, and why I mention that is because, look, we get advice, right, from a financial advisor, a mortgage advisor, uh, 
helps us, yeah, connects us with the right lending people and our accountant helps us with the structure and our lawyer warns us about legal risk and yada, yada, yada. But at the end of the day, we'll all make our own decisions. And so you do see properties which are, people are getting, have been getting like $10,000 refund a year. But that means it's $30,000 of loss and you worry about it. Yeah. Uh, and you say something to the client, hey, look, this is 10 grand is great, but um, it's, it's really time to get something positive into your property uh, portfolio. But mm. people are busy. Yeah, I'll get around to that. Um, it, it, human nature is often until we feel the pain, we won't change. Yeah, which would so, have been March this year that, yeah. when you had to submit those financials, right? That's yeah, and, would have and, been the pain. And, I don't be great to that. That's that's all of us, you know. It's like, oh, I've got to lose weight. Oh, yeah, I must, I must do something. It's when the trousers get too tight that you think, oh, okay, I can't fit these. Now I have to do something. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We, um, I mean, we see a lot of um, structures in their mortgage that aren't optimized for, um, you know, tax and, and including the interest only portion of you know the investment portion being interest only and paying down your um uh your you know owner occupied portion your personal portion of the mortgage uh we see it all the time it's really frustrating and some of this is to do with um the banks now the banks have a responsible lending um requirements these days and so they don't allow people to um stay on interest only for for a longer period you know they, they only five years and things but it's just coming back to that whole you know what what was right a couple of years ago may not be right today and it's it's about just adjusting that all the time and and i was thinking before um, we we sort of got online um, it really worries me when I hear people say, oh, I just, I do my own property accounts because it's so simple. You know, the rent goes in and the, the, the money goes out and that's really easy. But I think they I think they often miss a few, you know, small things that we can pick up on as, in terms of adjustments, right? Yeah. But I, I would say sort of two things. The, it's interesting to hear that because we often, I often ask people, do you deal with direct with the bank or through a mortgage advisor? And it's interesting how many people have the perception that if they deal direct with the bank, that they are better off. And perhaps some of it is from um, our, our need to feel in control. We all need to feel in control or have the illusion of being in control even if we're not in control. And so for some, dealing direct with the bank may give one that sense, you know, oh, well, they deal direct with me, I'm a special customer. I personally feel very doubtful about this and and feel that those who deal direct with the bank are bought into an illusion. Uh, and just <laughs> I, I, I can't guess, I can't comment because they watch these videos and <laughs> yeah. now, sorry bankers if you're watching. Yeah, I, I don't think you're very good at this. Um, and I just want to state the record, this is not a paid endorsement. Uh, <laughs> That's right, yeah. I'm not, yeah. Just across the board. Um, and in and, uh, and decades of, of doing accounting, we've found people who have a better experience with a mortgage broker. Uh, and, and I liken it to, look, the banks want to be all things to all people and, hey, we'll do your life insurance, we'll do your Kiwi Saver, we'll, we'll do this, the other, the other thing. But the, the, it's very difficult to be good at everything. And that's why they're specialties. That's, that's sort of why you don't go to your GP if you need brain surgery. You know, you go to the brain surgeon. Yeah. So yeah. I would call the mortgage brokers are the brain surgeons, you know. They go to the brain, <laughs> system, right, the brain surgery. And I'd use the same analogy, just getting back to the tax return thing, when it comes to, to property accounting. Look, a lot of clients we get are those who say, look, my accountant just, I don't feel he gets property. Um, so we'd like to, to say that property accountants are the, are the brain surgeons, you know. Um, yeah. Now, and I'm not disparaging that because business accounts is its own specialty, farming, corporate, you know, there's various specialties all within each and, and, and require you to be sort of on your game and aware of that. And we have particularly seen that as this year, you've got multiple places on a personal tax return where you can put your rental property, but where do you put that income? Uh, there's several boxes and uh, it took, you know, a careful study, a couple of practice rounds to make sure we were getting it right and all of our team knew 
this is where you put that in this situation. No, don't put it there, put it there. Do you choose residential um, portfolio method? Do you choose individual? Do you choose some sort of combined? There's a lot more complexity than there ever used to be. And the thing is the repercussions will be with you for years, either good or bad. So you choose the wrong method and you could come to the time where you try and offset your losses against something in the future and you can't because you chose individual and not portfolio. Yeah. So I guess we just all of us, yep, great, DIY, that's an awesome thing. We're a DIY nation, yeah, well done. But also modesty means recognizing the time I'm, I'm kind of a little bit out of my depth here. Maybe uh, I need to pay somebody and get some professional advice around it. So it's, you know, it's this balance between confidence and, and not being overconfident. And as humans, we're terrible at balance. We're from there from one into the other. So it's interesting, yeah, the, the same things, just genuinely, you know, whether it's us uh, at, at EpsonTax.com, uh, you know, or, or Mortgage Labs, actually, it's, so long as you get engaged with the proper people, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Mortgage advisors, mm -hmm. property accountants, that at least is something. <laughs> Even if we get no new clients out of this video. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to transcribe this video just so that I can rank on Google for mortgage advisors are like brain surgeons because I don't think that's anywhere else on the internet. <laughs> anyone else has made that, that comparison, so that's going to be great. <laughs> you stand by it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So um, one thing we often see, and, and uh, I'd like your feedback on this, was um, you know people have their owner occupied house and they they want to buy their um, uh, well they want to buy the upgrade their house and they often keep their owner occupied property because it's easier and real estate agents cost fifteen thousand dollars to you know use and blah blah blah. But quite often I try and get clients to just consider that, you know, is the house that you lived in bulletproof enough for insure, uh, for, for investment properties? Is it, um, you know, can you claim the right amount of tax? You bought it 15 years ago. How much tax could you claim on that? You know, it's, it's, um, did you see a lot of that people moving out and just renting their old house and, and what's your sort of thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, we do see a lot of that. Uh, and, and we see situations where, um, as you know, mentioned earlier, you end up with a lot more borrowing on the new house than on the old house, which is not a tax efficient situation. Because even if, and, and hence where you might use something like a look through company and can do a market value transaction at arm's length um, to get that sort of debt around a bit. Yeah. But it's a, it's a salient point. Uh, if just because you lived in the house, yeah, it's convenient. But then now you're stuck with this, uh, well, before you do something, think carefully. So maybe you move into a new house, you rent out the old one. But I would say before you did any restructure under advice of an accountant, you need to yeah, be dispassionate about it, exactly as you're saying, Luke. But uh, is this going to be a good investment for the next five years? Sometimes it's uh, it's your baby that you've... you've um, you've sunk all this and you've improved that and you've added that and the kids uh, took their first steps here. So it's, it's emotion, which is, which is great. We're emotional creatures, but in terms of helping you to build your portfolio for retirement and wealth creation, it might be a, a poor property to rent out. It might be better to be somebody else's family home and you use that money towards a, a good rental that's going to, to give you what you need. So, uh, you're definitely a really good point that you mentioned there. Mm. Hey, so it wouldn't be a discussion about accounting without the bright line test being mentioned. Are you seeing people getting caught by that? Are you, what, what's the sort of, actually, can you just give us a review of, of you know, what the bright line thresholds are and, and things just for people that don't know? Yeah, sure. So the, the it, some sort of, I guess you could say capital gains uh, tax has always been in place, just not by that name. Uh, but what the bright line, you know, i.e. if you have an intention to buy, sell with a profit, the sale of that property was always going to be a taxable thing. That's nothing new. What the bright line test is, it brought in some arbitrary date limits, which would catch you. So when that came in around 2015, uh, it was two years. So if you sold your property within two years of acquisition or acquiring an interest in it, then it's you get taxed on it, even if your intention wasn't 
to, to sell. Um, and there was a couple of exemptions uh, uh, using it as the main home was one exemption. Then that got extended to five years, and that was from about 2018, but they left the number of exemptions at two, interestingly enough. Hmm. So this uh, bright line test has certainly changed the whole discussion around property because every time you think about a change, you have to think about bright line. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, somebody recently, they wanted to change shareholdings and they looked through a company in which owned a rental. And so we pointed out, well, if you're going to do this, for those uh, shares you're changing, that will restart the bright line test. So if you, if you transfer 50 shares, say, or uh, between uh, one partner, one shareholder and the other, those 50 shares will now be subject to the five-year bright, bright, five bright line test from the date of transfer. So it, it suddenly affects, oh, well, if we sell this within five years, now half of that profit is going to be taxable profit because it's fifty percent of the shares. So, yeah, it's, because, it's certainly it's a big thing. You always need to consider it because moving from a personal name into an LTC is essentially a sale and and purchase, right? There is yeah, even though it's still me as the director of LTC, it's it's a sale and purchase, a renewal of that bright line. Correct. Uh, yeah. Moment, yeah. And, and something interestingly it is just in terms of timing. Those who do sort of land and build are actually have some kind of advantage because they're generally the, the, the date that you acquire an interest in a property where you, know, you buy the land and either it's completed and then you pay something at the end, if you're like a turnkey, or mm -hmm. land and build, which is like your, your incremental payments. It's when you first sign the sale and purchase agreement generally and you put some serious you know, deposit down, the bright line st starts there. But the house might not be built for 18 months, depending on title and construction and bad weather, et cetera. So meanwhile, you're already 18 months now into a five-year test by the time the house is constructed. That's mm -hmm. quite an advantage. Whereas you're know, rocking off, off the street and say, yep, I'll buy that house. The start date is not the signing of the sale and purchase date, right, as we know. It's when the lawyer transfers the ownership at... Um, what do they call that? Lynn's New Zealand. That yes. date, which is quite a late date, as we all know. And then this, this, the, the end of that is an early date when sale and purchase agreement is signed to sell it. So that can really catch you. And I'm sure that a lot of thought went into that. Um, and an idea said, hand on heart, this is just, you know, this is just the best date ever. But <laughs> it just yeah. so happens that you've got a very late start date and a very early sell date mm. uh, with an existing property. So that's something to watch. Well, it's the dates that are, are easily measurable. I think you can see it on the title, you know, and the, the council as the start date and then your intention to sell on the, the sale and purchase is, is, is there. So I can understand, but yeah, I think <laughs> they definitely skewed it in their favor for sure. I, I, um, I mean, five years is a long time, right? I mean, that 20, 25 months is a long time at the moment, but, but five years, a lot can happen in your financial situation. So, um, do you, as, are you seeing people uh, change their decisions um, because of this bright line test? Do you think, do you think people are uh, retaining their properties a bit longer? Yeah, definitely. If, if the effect was to slow down the market and the, the whole buying and selling, it's definitely had that effect. And previously we saw people who were uh, chopping and changing and moving into this property, moving out and we'll do this up and all of that. Now, unless you're a trader at the moment, they've really pulled that because you've got your home main home exemption, but yeah, you have to you can only have one main home at any one time, so it has to be used carefully and sparingly. So it definitely mm -hmm. has had that effect on on things. And yeah, five years, two years was one thing, but five years yep. is a con considerable chunk of time in, in that whole. Yeah. Year. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Now you deal with clients from all around uh, New Zealand. Um, are you seeing any sort of hotspots um, from your clients? Are you, uh, are you getting a bit of feedback there? Is um, I mean, uh, my, my I grew up in Wellington, so I kind of keep an eye on that market. Um, the the amount of stock in Wellington uh, at the moment is just. Uh, uh, abysmal <laughs> would be the only word I could use uh, if I'm recording a video. But it's, um, but yeah, you see any sort of exciting spots of people looking to the smaller towns or what are you seeing? 
Well, the, the interesting thing is what, where people buy is is usually something that we don't have much input on. Um, sure, yeah. So what, what often happens is they're either, they've got a connection to a place because their family or their or grandma lives nearby or they already have rentals in an area or their perhaps their financial advisor has directed them to say, hey, look, there's some stock we're aware of in this place and the numbers stack up, et cetera. Or you've got those that are watching trade me real estate, .co.nz. Uh, they are, uh, or possibly that they've got some connections with various real estate agents, good relationships, et cetera, or property groups on Facebook, et cetera. So that, that sort of thing, they more ca- I've found this property. Hey, can you look at the numbers? That's a nice scenario. Quite often, I've bought this property. Where should we put it? <laughs> why there is no here? There. <laughs> I mean, there, there has to be the there has to be the thing that accountants face, no matter what industry. That you know, if you're in a business, oh, I I bought this car in April last year. Is that is that going to be a problem kind of thing? And and yeah, for for property, it's like I bought this property. I think we need to set up some sort of you know company or partnership or <laughs> yeah. And then next question is when settlement on oh, Monday. <laughs> yeah yeah and in yeah. mortgage world we get we're going to an auction this weekend can we get an approval <laughs> right so um but that being said there's the things we say are, are often probably satellite towns or commuter towns uh or places where infrastructure is going ahead and it's cheap now but it won't always be that way so there's a lot of people who are, are still buying in uh, the towns in the Waikato area because they're um, not Cambridge. Cambridge is, is mega expensive, but they're mm-hmm. buying there because people are commuting to Hamilton or to Auckland or whatever for work. Same sort of thing, like in the area around Lebanon. There's yeah, as this uh, transmission gully uh, yeah. thing is going through, that you know suddenly commuting to Wellington becomes a bit more viable. So um, yeah, Rotorua, Kawaro. So we're often seeing that in the small towns. Uh, we have heard historically up north that there's been also some good purchases there for the same reason that you were mm. in striking distance, maybe of Bangarang, uh, places yeah. like that. Yeah, the One Tree Point, uh, is One Tree Point, is that where the port's going up there? And, and uh, yeah, there's a lot of uh, speculation up there and, and big suburbs uh, sort of blossoming out of nowhere, but it's, um, yeah, very interesting, yeah. Mm. Great. Well, hey, think, is there anything else that you'd want sort of people to know out there just at the moment, um, just to be sort of aware of? Um, uh, is there anything potentially coming on the horizon? Yeah, so there is one more thing, and that is just to look at the impact of the, um, the Residential Tenancies Amendments Act 2020. Now, uh, with, as it happens just yesterday, I put a, a summary on our blog, uh, and so there's a self plug epsimtax.com forward slash blog. We'll, we'll get uh, the headline, we'll get the link in the video. So, yeah. uh, more because I'd, I'd obtained that summary and just trying to what's the impact, what, how's it going to affect us? Is there anything we need to do? Uh, okay, yeah, there might be. Or, all right, well, what do our clients need to think about? Yeah, because I'm a property investor myself. So, you think about the effect on, um, on your own uh, properties and tenants. Um, so, yeah, there's some key dates coming, and one of the main things is going to be the fact that you can only put your rent up once a year. Mm. And we would probably say it's always a commercial decision, a balance between, look, this tenant is great, they look after the property, uh, and I don't, I never want to give the appearance of milking them, as it were, you know, because uh, if you make people feel bad, they'll go. People remember how you, how you made them feel, right? They don't remember what you said. But how you make them feel. But at the same time, the reality is that you do have, you know, prices are going up because that's inflation. Uh, uh, so it, it really means every year and 60 days out because you've got to give the 60 day notice of being conscious, are we going to do an increment? And, and it's probably better to do a, a smaller increase every year than wait three years and then a massive increase yep. that's really going to cause upset uh, and, and hurt feeling. So um, it, it's it's the balance of again trying to get that that right because yeah you want to look after your tenants um, but generally a landlord our role is not social housing providers uh, yeah. that's the government uh, handles that you see so 
the, the fact is that everybody who's entered into buy order property is, is not running a charity. They are planning to make some money out of it. So not wanting to sound harsh or anything, but that is the reality of, of it, it's business, isn't it? Mm. So trying to get that right, you do have to be aware of that. Yes, be kind, uh, be a person of feeling, but you are also running a business. So there's, there's a balance to be attained here. So and that's I, the I big think- thing I'd say. I, I, I hear that a lot as well. You know, they, they keep their rents the same for three years. They've had a long-term tenant. They don't want to annoy them or lose a, a good tenant, right? But but in some ways, jumping rent up after three or four years by $100 to, to get near the market again is is crueler than a $20 a a year increase, right? That's yeah, it's 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 like going in your mortgages from two point five to four percent, right? Like it's it, that's a real price shock to that person. You'll definitely lose them at that point. Uh, so yeah, I, I think readjusting your your um your rent regular well, so what annually um mm. is is a much nicer thing to do. Yeah. And, and just the other thing is that while this year, right up to the sixteenth of March, twenty twenty one while the expense threshold is lifted up to 5,000, it's going to drop to 1,000 after that. This might be the time to uh, get that deck or get that red carpet done. You know, anything which is going to involve some major cash outlay should be done now so that you can make the most of that this year. At least you, you'll have a nice fat loss. That may or may not benefit you for the 2021 tax year, but you can at least claim that whole amount instead of having to claim it over perhaps five years, et cetera. Well, and, and everyone should have done the insulation, uh, but but also just improving like heat pumps and things, you know, they all fit within that uh, above 1,000, but below 5,000 sort of bracket, right? That mm. that um, people can do, yeah. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a great tip, yeah. Mm. Awesome. Thank you for that. So if people want to get hold of you and just, just chat, because I know uh, one of the resounding bits of feedback that we get from uh, your clients that we deal with uh, is that you're really approachable and, and great to ask questions for and really, really helpful. So, um, so, so thank you for that. Thank you for looking after our clients for that. So um, uh, how can they get hold of you? So epsomtax.com is the best way. Yeah, there's a contact form that comes through my email and then we, we pretty much will will acknowledge that within sort of you know, 24 hours usually. And it's usually easiest just have a quick chat over the phone because generally sort of most things can be sorted in 10, 15 minutes over the, the phone. There's not many situations that are so bizarre, peculiar or complex that they require really full on chat. Thank goodness. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Hey, thanks for your, uh, thanks for dialing in, Gareth. That's, that's been really helpful. Um, we will uh, catch up with you in probably a few months and uh, just see how the market's going and, and, uh, and get an update. But thanks for uh, dialing in. Yeah. Thanks for having us today, um, Rupert. And it was a pleasure to chat with the good folks at Morgan's Land. <laughs> Cheers.